Well, thank you, Julio, for that kind introduction. I'm not sure I thank you for all that build-up because, of course, now it can only be a disappointment. Um, so, uh, yes, the best talks, just like the best meals, are when you go to a restaurant that you wa weren't expecting was going to be that good, and then you find something really nice. That's the best ones, not the ones that you've, you know, waited and waited and waited, and you have so much expectations built up for. So, if I can have my slides, please. We can have that removed and back to mine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I will talk about breeding and building molecules to spine cells and tumors. And I'll briefly touch on where we were in 2004 with fluorescent proteins. Um, and then move on to some of the most recent developments, which are uh, singlet oxygen generating mini protein, infrared fluorescent protein. In each case, the people in my lab who are most responsible are shown below. Uh, and when we have outside collaborators there, sort of pushed over, they're right justified. Uh, but I want to switch from the genetically encoded indicators toward, uh, in the second part of the talk, toward building synthetic molecules once again, uh, to especially to, as Julio alluded to, to look at cancer in particular, but not just cancer, some other diseases as well, as I will uh, very briefly mention, not just to image them, but possibly to provide some therapy uh, that might help. And uh, so these are the people involved. I won't read them all here, because you can read them for yourself. And also, they're listed on each slide in, in general. Uh, and I do have to put in the obligatory ex disclosure that because we know that if this is actually ever going to help real people, we have to go through the industrial route to FDA approval. We have to tr at least try this. That will need a company. And so we have managed to start a very small little company. And uh, the, the named uh, initial people are advisors who have some stock in the usual way, all licensed through the University of California. So uh, this is where we got to in 2004, a palette of non-oligomerizing fluorescent proteins. Uh, and I admit I showed this at a Nobel symposium where I guess they were auditioning people. Uh, and uh, um, Roger Kornberg gave his talk. And, uh, uh, before, and then the, the rib whole bunch of ribosome people gave talks. And um, so. Uh, you get an idea what they're thinking about. Uh, I was rather surprised that they took much interest in it, but it was rather colorful. And so this shows the proteins that are derived from the jellyfish, the blue, cyan, green, and yellow, and then a whole s further spectrum derived from corals, particularly from a red fluorescent protein from dis discosoma, which we had to monomerize. That was the hard bit. And then changing the wavelengths was not too hard. And the most fun part was to come up with their names, which came after consulting the Crayola website and realizing <laughs> that uh, it was time for something a little more memorable. And so they got named uh, monomeric honeydew, banana orange, et cetera. And these are now notorious in uh, a lot of biological applications. Now, having shown you that, I then want to be the first to acknowledge that fluorescent proteins do have some severe limitations. Uh, and uh, we've always been conscious of them. Sometimes the fluorescent proteins are just too big. They are always uh, more than 200 amino acids, typically 220 to 240, forming an 11-stranded beta barrel. Uh, and it's surprising how often fluorescent host proteins fused to them can get away with this huge fusion and uh, survive and uh, function fairly normally, but it isn't always true. And for those cases, we do have de we have developed small peptides as small as 12 amino acids that selectively bind small synthetic molecules. But today, I don't have really time to go into that. Uh, the next issue is that being fluorescent and therefore optical, conventional optical resolution is on the order of 200 nanometers, and that's inadequate for many questions in cell biology where we need higher resolution. And there's been a huge amount of activity in this uh, arena, uh, particularly with super resolution optical microscopy, including some from Shimon Weiss right here in the audience. But uh, I won't have anything to contribute in that regard. But instead, something off from left field is that with Mark Ellisman, we've been working on singlet oxygen generating proteins for electron microscopy. And I'll try to give you a little feeling for what that can do as a complementary way of getting molecular uh, uh, highlighting or molecular imaging at the electron microscopic level. Going in the opposite direction, if you want to work inside an intact mouse or other thick uh, mammal with uh, a reasonable 
more than a millimeter or so of tissue in front of it, you come to the problem that excitation wavelengths of less than 600 nanometers are very bad at penetrating. And we really want fluorescent proteins that would go at longer wavelengths. And I'll just briefly mention the progress we've made there. And then beyond that, uh, with the, uh, the, the issue is that if we want to work in people, uh, we are, ourselves are too thick and opaque for most applications of fluorescence, even at 600, 700 nanometer excitation. Therefore, we need imaging techniques like positron emission tomography, particularly popular here at UCLA, as well as magnetic resonance. And we also don't want to have to transfer genes necessarily because that is gene therapy, which has its own difficulties. And so we've gone back to some organic chemical synthesis of probes that uh, localize contrast agents and eventually even therapeutic agents at sites of high proteolytic activity. So let me address this issue about the uh, conventional optical resolution. It would be nice if we could look at proteins in the fluorescence, in electron micro microscopy. And up to now, this has almost always been done with immuno-EM, or immuno-electron microscopy. And you've all heard of it, and you're probably mostly afraid of it. It's something that's considered very tough to do, and you have to go to a specialist who is good at it. It's rarely done. And the intrinsic problem is simply that in order to get preservation of tissue for the electron microscope, you have to fix it, the tissue well. And the process of fixation makes it extremely hard for antibodies to get in or out. And you have to be able to wash off excess on a body that has not yet found its target. Uh, and uh, it also, the fixation, uh, typically with aldehydes at least, destroys the antigenicity. So you have a choice. You can either ex barely fix the tissue or not fix it at all, or work on frozen, just frozen sections. Then the antibodies can get in, but you can't see anything else in the tissue. Uh, and furthermore, your label is just gold or some dense particle with no catalytic amplification. So you can only get a small fraction of the antigens uh, labeled with yours and uh, then see a stochastic sampling of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, molecules left in the tissue. If you fix hard, then as I say, the antibodies don't penetrate. So uh, we think that uh, this uh, possible solution is a genetically encoded singlet oxygen generator, SOG, and we are th actually think that this one might do for electron microscopy what GFP did for fluorescence. This starts out as a 106 amino acid fragment of Arabidopsis phototropin. So phototropin is one of the blue light receptors in the mustard plant, the famous well-known genetic model organism for plants. And it had been sequenced. It is binds flavins. Uh, and there is a crystal structure of the entire phototropin uh, before we chopped off the signal transduction domains or before Schalk and Shu particularly did it. And we also destroyed the cysteine that used to be responsible for most of the signal transduction because in the excited state, that cysteine used to come along and bind to the flavin ring. So by replacing with glycine, we shut off that, that potential reaction. And the net result, after a certain amount more engineering, is a protein that absorbs in a typical way like a flavin. It has some fluorescence, a quantum yield of about 0.3. But most importantly, it has a quantum yield for generating singlet oxygen of 0.47, almost a half. So it's quite a good, efficient generator of singlet oxygen. Now, many of you are probably asking yourself, what the hell is signet oxygen? And why is that uh, of any value, especially for electron microscopy? Well, it's been known for a long time that if you can generate singlet oxygen, and here we're doing it by ex exciting the tr flavin cofactor. And here I've schematized the protein just by this green oval. We excite it to the singlet state. It has a high probability of crossing to the triplet state. And there, it has a decent probability of colliding with oxygen gas. The gas that we breathe all the time is triplet oxygen. And then when these two triplets meet each other, the triplet falls back to the ground state. And the triplet state of oxygen turns to the singlet, which is ex an excited state of oxygen. One of the famous reactive oxygen species that people always talk about as damaging cells. And that's what we have a quantum yield. Every, for every uh, 100 photons that excite this, we'll get 47 singlet oxygens out. And this process can be done many times until eventually the, the 
dye does, the flavin does bleach. Now, this singlet oxygen has long been known to be able to react with diaminobenzidine. Now, remember, this is for electron microscopy, so we're doing this in a dead fixed tissue. We have no, no issues about putting in 10 millimolar diaminobenzidine. And the singlet oxygen immediately oxidizes this up to a quinone amine, which then polymerizes by oxidative addition into a polymer that is then a dense phenazine uh, polymer that is stainable with osmium tetroxide. Now, so this whole purpose of the labrous procedure is that wherever this is and where we shine the light, we will deposit a polymer that eventually picks up osmium in a highly amplifying process. The protein was introduced genetically by transfection, by fusion to whatever protein we are interested in watching. And everything else is a small molecule ranging from oxygen gas, diaminobenzidine, osmium, et cetera. So this can be done after very heavy fixation, and it will still produce, in a catalytically amplifying way, a dense stain. And uh, so this is some just at the uh, light level, this is what you see. Here are some tissue culture cells, some of which have been, and they've been transiently transfected. So some of the cells have picked up the SOG, the singlet oxygen generator. And you can see that it's this cell and the, this process here. They are somewhat fluorescent. It's not a great fluorescence. Uh, the quantum meal is only 0.3. The extinction is only a little over 10,000. And it bleaches pretty fast. But it's just enough to, to, to mark which ones. And then and the fixed cells, after we photooxidize, we can build up so much precipitate that you can see the cells turn visibly black and then stain them with osmium. And in this case here, we're, I'm already shifting on for reasons of time to a cytochrome C fusion with singlet oxygen generator. And this is now within the mitochondria. We see the fluorescence in a confocal view beforehand. Then we uh, photoconvert it uh, and get the dense precipitate. This is in transmission. And by the way, if you, you notice some, there's some slight discrepancies. This is a stack of maximum projection transmission. So it's a different 3D resolution in that one. But overall, it corresponds. And the key is that then after photo, uh, we go to the electron microscope and magnify, you can see individual mitochondria with the familiar Christie and so on at a high resolution well beyond the optical. Uh, when we apply this to one of our standard uh, test beds, which is the connexin, uh, uh, the gap junction protein, connexin 43, fused to the mini uh, singlet oxygen generator, uh, it, uh, it nicely, la densely labels gap junctions within in text. And we can even get a hint here of the negative staining power of this. Uh, first thing, all of the, the whole junction is densely labeled. It's not just stochastic spots here and there with gold, as you would with uh, immuno. EM, uh, and you can just about see these wedges that are, we believe, the individual connexins uh, as actually negative contrast uh, because the precipitate is filled in all the spaces uh, in between them. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the fineness and uh, uh, of this uh, precipitate. And to give you an example of a biological problem that this, we think this will be applicable to, uh, this happens to be something else we're interested in the lab, which is adhesion systems at developing synaptic clefts, a cartoon of some of the famous players, neuroligans, neurexins, where neurexins are well known to be specifically presynaptic, neuroligans postsynaptic. But then there's also these molecules called syncams, synaptic cell adhesion molecules, of which, again, there's two flavors, one and two. And they're known to be at synaptic junctions, but existing antibodies have not yet been able to distinguish who's pre and who's post-synaptic in this system. And there's SYNCAM1 and 2. So it's a simple enough matter. You fuse SYNCAM1 to mini SOG and photooxidize it. This happens to be cortical neurons in culture. And there's the, uh, uh, the uh, labeled uh, uh, protein showing up in the EM with, uh, you know, at lighter resolution, you get to see everything else, the microfilaments and, uh, uh, and other outlines of the cell. Uh, there's a magnified view. That's obviously a mitochondrion cut across. And this uh, um, a structure is a presynaptic terminal because it's filled with vesicles. Uh, which did not have to be labeled in any special way. And the density here is the SYNCAM1, we believe. And we believe that when SYNCAM1 gets inserted into a synaptic cleft, it always seems to be on the presynaptic side because it's also on the side with synaptic vesicles. So far, it now looks. 